that uh, the other treatment really for this condition, there has been discovery, there's then been a realization of, of the side effects that the particular treatments might uh, uh, produce. This has then led to evolving strategies. And also there's been uh, a recurrent returning to ideas, looking at the past to, uh, to see how things might be changed for the future. So what's the theory, what do we do now? Well, I think the approach now is what we, we might term rational polypharmacy, which sounds like an oxymoron, particularly in a, a meeting about healthy medicine. But um, there's a feeling that if you don't put all of your eggs in one dopaminergic basket, then we reduce the risk of side effects, we get a lot of the benefits, and so very typically now you'll see people on two, three, maybe even more Parkinson's drugs, but at smaller doses. It is now rare to see people on more than 600 milligrams of new dopa in a day. Um, it is rare to see people reaching the top doses of, uh, of the uh, oral dopa risks. I'm sure you're all familiar with this kind of story. Gambling addiction as a, as a complication of treatment, particularly with dopamine agonists. And this was first observed in about a dozen patients. But it isn't just, just gambling that can, uh, that can result from Parkinson's treatment. There's a whole range of other impulse control disorders. Hypersexuality, shopping, punding. So punding is, uh, Technically, you wouldn't necessarily call this an impulse control disorder, but it can manifest itself in a, in a similar way. So, punding is repetitive, pointless tasks, taking apart radios and trying to put them back together again, constantly getting things out of your pocket, filling them and putting them back again. That's punding. It's something that's first observed in amphetamine users. It's a Swedish word, it means blockhead. It just means it's kind of ripped, it's the pointlessness of the task. Interestingly, with punding, it's more commonly seen in. Um, in what's called the dopamine dysregulation syndrome. These are people who are classically on levodopa rather than dopamine agonists. But it, it can present itself in a, in a similar sort of way. So just to recap on the, the sort of history that's working backwards on the major sort of steps forward. 1997, deep brain stimulation. 1991, the first non-ergot dopamine agonist. 1975, monoergonoxate B inhibitors. 74, the ergot dopamine agonist in Parkinson's. 1970, apomorphine. 69, dopamine dopa decarboxylase inhibition. 67, usable levodopa. And the back of century, 1867, belladonna. So that is the history of the emergence of, of Parkinson's disease treatment. Or is it? In fact, if you look further back, you see that selegiline was actually discovered in 1964. It was thought to be an antidepressant at that time, and it wasn't for a number of years that it actually were used in Parkinson's disease. In the 1950s, thalamotomy was a relatively common treatment for Parkinson's disease. It was recognized that lesioning uh, parts of the brain could have anti-Parkinsonian effects. But it was a half a century before a, a less irreversible, a more palatable treatment came about. Apomorphine was actually proposed as a treatment for Parkinsonism in 1884. But unfortunately, it was the wrong Parkinsonism that uh, was proposed. It was, it was proposed as a treatment for Sydenham's career. And uh, a huge amount of time, less part of a century, was lost to potentially looking at it in Parkinson's disease. The central nervous system effects of ergot drugs were recognized back in the 19th century as well. But it was just thought to be part of the ergot toxicity effect, and the penny didn't drop, that actually maybe some of this could be harnessed in people with Parkinson's disease. And back in 4500 BC, the people that practiced Ayurvedic medicine used a treatment called lacuna, or campanata. Here it is. It's a leguminous plant, rather like the peanut or the pea, and the, uh, the pods that you see there are a very rich source of naturally occurring levodopa. So it's one thing to know the answer, but I think as history has shown us, it's an entirely different thing to know what the question is. So that's what's been in the past. What, what's coming up? One of the things I most commonly get asked in the clinic um, is, are we any closer to a cure, doctor? Um, what we can do is talk about 
that kind of uh, treatment that are being looked at. So, the rather catchily titled IPX066 is, uh, is in a relatively advanced stage of research. This is a long acting form of levodopa. And I hear you saying, but we already have control of this levodopa. They say that this is one that works. Um, we were in to, uh, well, we wait to see the results of the research to find out if that is the case. But if that is, is something that that is, is true, then potentially we're going to get closer to evening out some of those ups and downs that we, we see in treatment. Gene therapy attracts a lot of attention. There are two bits of gene therapy that have been looked at at the moment. One called nurturing, the other one called Pro7. And uh, they're both at a relatively early stage, so stage one to stage two studies, looking mainly at safety and efficacy. They tend to use a sort of viral vector to, uh, to allow the, the drug to sort of uh, sort of taken on board, they're injected directly into the, the nasal ganglia. And the idea is that the genes kind of switch on um, factors that will then allow regeneration of uh, infected cells. Stem cell therapy um, is also being looked at, so looking at fetal stem cells, but also a slightly different approach is trying to derive stem cells from adipose tissue. For quite some time there's been research looking at actual grafting of fetal cells into the nasal ganglia. And this has been shown to be tolerable, the grafts have taken, they've had some anti-Parkinsonian effects. But some of the patients who have actually been through those studies have now died and had post-mortems. And quite surprisingly, that's demonstrated that the grafted cells actually show evidence of new bodies. So even though the cells are only a few years old, the actual pathological process seems to affect even the grafted cells.